Hello and welcome to our fourth annual virtual fundraiser, Building Together. I'm Ryan, content developer at Admirato, and I want to welcome all of you who have joined us to celebrate this past year and to look ahead at the year to come. This is an exciting time for Admirato. First, because we're celebrating 10 years as an organization. This is also an exciting time of transition as we launch ahead on our new platform, admirato.org. All of this change is as a direct result of your prayerful and financial support throughout the years. Throughout this event, we'll be sharing more of what Admirato is and the many changes that this brings. We'll be reflecting on the past 10 years and we'll be previewing some of what is coming up in the next year. You'll be hearing from my colleagues, Jennifer Loop, our Director of Ministry Engagement, as well as Dr. David Seamuth, our Founder and President. You'll also be hearing from Professor N.T. Wright, who will be bringing you an encouraging message just for you. Throughout the event, we encourage you to join us in the chat. Let us know where you're coming from and how Admirato has benefited you. You can also use the link in the description below to visit our website and check out the many resources and subscriptions that we have available to you. You can also use that link to donate to help support our mission of bringing engaging theology to the world. Let's get started. In March of 2020, work from home becomes a thing. And we decided to offer those small groups that we had formed the previous year. We thought, what if we just offered that for free? Put that out on Facebook and social media. Maybe people might want something to do or study together. It was starting to take root. We gave away a small groups course on Philippians for free in March of 2020, and 40,000 people signed up. And I started engaging with people all over the world. One of whom I remember was an 80-year-old woman contacted me, having trouble signing in, needed a password reset. And she was part of a small group that used to get together and play cards. She'd never heard of Professor N.T. Wright. She saw something for free on Facebook and <laughs> thought it was good to sign up. And she and her friends who played bridge wanted to know what this was all about and how to get in. And that story repeated itself all over as it spread from continent to continent. And I still spend a lot of time helping people log in. <laughs> One month later, after that, after giving away that small groups course, our team was incredibly disappointed because we had to cancel a week of in-person events with Professor Wright that had been scheduled for April of 2020 across Illinois and Wisconsin. There'd been a lot of planning, and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to all of the things that you had to miss and things that you didn't get to go to and things that got canceled and parties that never happened and graduations or weddings, all that planning. We created poster boards, we had flyers, we had all kinds of events. And one of those poster boards that we had was from a student who I met, her name is Charlene, who's up here with me. She was our first, one of our first student spotlight storyboards, and I remember when I corresponded with her by email, she had a picture that her daughter had created, a mug, um, that said, How God Became King, which is the title of one of Professor Wright's books, and we used it on our storyboard. And we spotlighted her and her family, but in April of 2020, that poster board never went up anywhere. It stayed in our office, and in fact, the first time we used it was last year at our annual event. And so you see, all of those things weren't wasted. All of those little seeds and opportunities and people we met along the way. During the pandemic, we launched our first Bible plan on the YouVersion app. It was called A Journey from Worry to Confident Hope, Praying Through the Lord's Prayer. And we found that people were worried a lot had a bit of anxiety about what was going on in the world. And I looked it up today, and that Bible plan has over 250,000 completions. By July of 2020, we reached 100,000 students on Udemy. Well, pandemic con continues on. October of 2020, we think we still need to film a course 
I have friends over in the United Kingdom that were willing to host me for two weeks. I had to live in their home. I couldn't leave the house, not even in the front yard. John and Margaret Wallace hosted me in their home. I quarantined for two weeks. And while I did that, we were anticipating the filming of Surprised by the God of Hope. But while I did that, I was talking to more and more students like Charlene all over the world, some of whom were quarantining in hotels, some of whom couldn't get home, uh, people who weren't able to get out. Different countries had different lengths of time for lockdown. And I decided to record my interviews with some of these students but with this new uh, website called Zoom. <laughs> and we thought, what if we use those recordings in our first ever virtual fundraiser? Because, of course, we couldn't gather in 2020 either. We did it virtually, and now we still do it. So, we, with the help of a lot of people who are good at pasting all of that together, we put together all of those interviews and talked about some of the things we were doing and invited that online audience into, into our space and connected with lots and lots of people. And at the end of that year, Collins English Dictionary named lockdown the word of the year. By 2021, as time's going on, we start to enter somewhat of post-pandemic world. We're kind of moving on and trying to figure out how to continue to grow and lengthen our cords and strengthen our stakes. You've heard us talk about that with Building Together. And we moved into sharing office space with Telling the Truth, which is a local ministry that many of you know. And in summer, we hired Ryan Liguori as our content developer, and then I began as director of ministry engagement, because it seems like I'm better at connecting with people than I am at developing content. <laughs> in September of 2021, we launched our Instagram page with the help of our friends at Epiphio, and we're at 69,000 followers, and the wonderful thing about that is reaching a whole new demographic. And what we're trying to do is keep pace and respond to the new normal all around the world. Churches began meeting online. They needed resources and materials specifically for digital and asynchronous learning. And a lot of local colleges and universities started going completely online. We wanted to be well poised to meet those churches' needs to provide theological training and education that they were asking for. And I'm still, in, I'm still in contact with people all over. I'm talking to someone in Nashville right now who runs um, house churches called My Local, mm -hmm. talking to other people, uh, one of whom I'm thinking of is in the Netherlands looking at try, trying to run small groups there. All kinds of different needs while still trying to be as personal as possible and finding creative solutions for what meets their needs in their context. We're trying to stay in step with what's going on culturally and respond with biblical teaching. In February of 2022, we produced our first Team Talk course with Professor Wright and Professor Esau McCauley, who's at Wheaton College, Ethnicity, Justice, and the People of God, which is one of our most popular small groups used in churches. At the end of that year, our team filmed our first YouTube devotional series called Reading Scripture Together which is free content, which is what we've been trying to produce more and more, free and accessible. You might be surprised to know that some of our YouTube students, in fact, a majority of them, are maybe not what you might think. In fact, 32% of our audience is 65 or, 65 or older. We've got regulars that show up every week when we drop our new videos on Mondays, regulars like Grandma Sherry, who I'm in contact with and who prays for our ministry. And this week, 15 and a half thousand people turned into our new series, Thinking Through Salvation, What Happens When You Die. So wrapping up, just turning to this year, just some highlights. I think our team embodies hybrid work as much as possible, online but still in person, and trying to be as personal as possible. We launched a course with Professor Esau McCauley, A Journey Through Lent. And Ryan and I hosted an ecumenical Lenten gathering on Zoom with about 30 people. We did reflections, readings, and prayers, and just tried to connect with people. In June, our entire team traveled to Houston for our summer intensive in partnership with Truett, Baylor Uni Truett Seminary and Baylor University, and 500 people showed up. And it was a time for our team to be able to be together. We announced our new learning platform, Admirado, and had a real warm audience with 500 people who could be our beta testers. 
as they, as they helped us with feedback to launch publicly in August on Admirado and our first course on Romans 8, the heart of Romans. And just two days ago, we did our first Admirado live event. The new platform has online communities because what we've been hearing is that people want to engage together and learn together online. And what we want to do is be a safe and gracious space where people can do that. And Charlene is our new online community leader. It's a wonderful platform where people can post questions, engage with each other, and learn together. And no one is more excited than that than Charlene. You're the perfect person for that. So just to wrap this up, we want to thank you for helping us do what we think is what God is doing, his kingdom work in the world. And we couldn't do it without you. <coughs> Uh, two people I'll call up in just a moment, um, Paul Sinclair and Sean Thinney Bascaron, um, participated with me and about 30 other people in an event that we held um, at the Telling the Truth office called Front Row Seat. And if you haven't heard of Front Row Seat, in partnership with Basics, which is a local ministry here, a lot of you might know, Brothers and Sisters in Christ Serving, we hosted a dialogue between eight panelists to discuss their experience and thoughts on issues of race, inclusion, justice, healing relationships, and more. And we had 25 to 30 people show up at the office, gathered at tables just like you're sitting here, listening to panelists, my husband was one of them, um, have an open discussion and dialogue about these issues. And then they'd have a moderated discussion at each of the tables. So I'm going to invite our friends Shanthony and Paul up and just talk a little bit more about some of the things that we got to do um, and also your experience with our ministry. How have you seen our ministry grow and change over the past 10 years? Yeah, um, I think you know, my wife and I attend Eastport Church, and so we have used several of the courses in the uh, in the um, courses, the Christian ed classes on Sunday morning. And so we really appreciated <coughs> being involved in some of those. The Life of Paul was one, uh, Galatians we've used. Um, and then of course, we really appreciate, you know, the, the ministry itself, Wisconsin Center, taking the time and the acknowledging the importance of having an event like mm -hmm. Front Row Seat. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the other thing that I really partici I participated in and really appreciated was uh, Dr. McCauley and, and Dr. Light's course yeah. on, on race, um, which has really been a, really a, a mm -hmm. blessing to me. Uh, when I was on staff at Elmbrook, Lisa and I lived in the city, and we were um, in Sherman Park area, and so Dave's involvement with a number of city pastors over the years in mentoring them, in serving with a cohort with them, and I've always appreciated that about Dave, of how mm -hmm. he rallies around pastors and, and he doesn't take them under his wing. It doesn't need to be done. But he, he comes along and supports and encourages them in their own studies. Mm -hmm. You should just want to. Do you want to say a little bit more about Front Row Seed at all in our time together doing that? Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, it wasn't a particularly large group. Uh, we had a Front Row Seed at Eastbrook Church uh, several months before that. But I think it allows people from different backgrounds, different narratives, different um, perspectives, theologically speaking, lived experience to come together and talk about a reality that's within our nation that needs to be talked about, that needs to be addressed, not fixed. Aside from God doing something rather spectacular and miraculous mm -hmm. in our nation, I don't think that the race issue is gonna be fixed. But I think over time as people's hearts and lives and relationships are established, that will, that will make a significant difference. And I think Front Row Seat did that. I think for me with Front Row Seat, it was just a really good opportunity to listen um, and learn from others. Yeah. Uh, I think I loved the community because it wasn't for, for those of us who, were, who got involved with it, whether it was as panelists or, you know, uh, we we had more than just front rows, more than just the day. There was you know connections before there was, uh, and then we ended up doing the study yes. on race, ethnicity, and the people of God together online, which we got to experience this online course uh, with a, as a group, and that was really I I think for me, listening and learning from two people who were very culturally different from me. 
and hearing their perspectives were very, was a really growing experience. So. One of the things you really helped me out when we started doing the Ethnicity, Justice, and People of God course together, we would watch it on, we would watch it together. I think we had five or six people mm -hmm. that did a study. Yeah. Well, I'm used to answering people's questions about how to do this, all the students, and then, of course I couldn't figure out how to do it when I was supposed to be leading the course and Shantani had to put it on on her computer. And so it just was, I actually got to live what other people are doing when they're trying to, yeah. Yeah. to, to use yeah. the courses. But in partnership with Basics, it was great because we got to give away the Ethnicity Justice People of God course for free mm -hmm. and people got to study it can study it yeah. together yeah. and it was a way to come together with another local ministry to partner with our resources yeah. and mm -hmm. online courses and to also get together and to 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 be in person again yeah. um, so um anything else i kind of skipped over that one question about how our online resources have helped you personally or your ministry in any other way you might have already answered that when we were talking about pharmacy. well i'm one of those people who if anything is for free i will download it <laughs> so <laughs> I have really enjoyed a number of those courses that have come up and said, little free study on, you know, and I, I'll pick great. that up. But I really like the study that we did together, uh, the ethnicity justice and people of God study, because it wasn't just watching a video, but it was the discussion and hearing each other. And it, it was, and you think, oh my God, that won't work online, but it does. And, you know, I'm kind of excited in this new season because you have an opportunity to, you know, really go yeah. big with it. Yeah. Um, this, this doesn't have something directly connected with uh, the Wisconsin Center. Uh, but just today in, in Shantani and I both teach at a uh, ministry that's carried out at Fox Lake Correctional, which is run by Trinity International and another mm -hmm. nonprofit. And, those men that come, um, I've opened their lives up to a little bit about N.T. Wright. So I use mm -hmm. quotes in my class regularly because I'm teaching a class mm -hmm. on the Old Testament prophets. And I want to just read a quote that I read today in class. And two of the men said they want to get uh, the, a couple of books by N.T. Wright. So I need to get some, some books from N.T. Wright. But I read this quote. But certainly it relates to the men in their own situation mm -hmm. in prison. Dr. Wright writes, Jesus doesn't give an explanation for the pain and sorrow of the world. He comes where the pain is most acute and takes it upon himself. Jesus doesn't explain why in suffering, why there's illness, why there's death in the world. He brings healing and hope. He doesn't allow the problem of evil to be the subject of a seminar. He allows evil to do its worst to him. He exhausts it, drains its power, and emerges with new life. And I think, I think, you know, with, with a, a resource like Dr. Right, whether it's in, a, in an <clears throat> online course or, or even books in places like penal institutions, I think it's an extension of, of the ministry. Yeah. One of the other things that we're trying to do is offer more <coughs> free resources. Like you mentioned, who doesn't like free? So with the new platform, we have all of our three free courses, free Bible plans, and the free eBooks now in one place. So mm -hmm. people don't have to go searching around mm -hmm. on all different places. Yeah. It's all in one spot. And even especially when I talk to people uh, in the, the global majority world who are looking for things that are free and they can access right mm -hmm. away and they can share with their communities. It's just been a lot wonderful to have a platform where I can mm -hmm. just get them on and yeah. get them resources yeah. right away. Yeah, yeah. For sure. yeah. One yeah. of the, the, so the last question, our new name and platform, Admirato, again, that surprise and wonder and wondering um, with God and together, um, we want to be, like I said, a safe and gracious space where people can um, explore possibilities and, and to learn together, not give me the answer to this question, which is a lot of what people come. I have this question about this in Romans 8, what's the right answer? And um, I'll send them over to Charlene and in a community group so they can talk about it. And it's probably frustrating, but that's how I think we learn best. So the engaging theology that we've been trying to talk to people has a sort of double meaning. Like we want theology to be engaging, but we also want it to be something that we're doing together. So I just wanted to ask you last question. What does engaging theology mean to you? You go. <laughs> <laughs> For me, engaging theology, I, I, I equate that to just having a, 
a practical theology of life, to take, to take scripture, to take, to take biblical truth and apply it as an example with, with men in prison or whatever in a way that a, a man could, can use scripture, can use the, the truth of scripture in a way that affects their life and gives them mm -hmm. a different perspective on, on where they're living their lives. Um, I guess that's how we apply it. For me, uh, not being a theologian, uh, engaging theology is so, uh, you know, just being able to engage with courses and teachers whom I can trust. You know, there's so much out there online. And here you can go and, and get solid teaching uh, from people you can mm -hmm. trust. And, uh, and then for me, then as I minister to others, I can minister out of that strong foundation and, you know, yeah, that's what it would mean for me. So. And we hope that now with our new space and a name like Admirado, we can invite more scholars and more teachers in with new topics and different things. So next year at this time, who knows how many other different kinds of teachers and topics that we can offer. Um, so thank you both for giving a little picture into how we partnered together. Um, thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. O oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on that day at Massa in the wilderness, when your ancestors tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation, and said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they do not regard my ways. Therefore in my anger I swore, they shall not enter my rest. Thus far, Psalm 95. As a good Anglican, I've probably prayed Psalm 95 more frequently than any other psalm. As many of you may know, it comes at the start of morning prayer in the traditional Book of Common Prayer, which still forms the backbone of my early morning habit of life. It belongs, of course, with several other psalms that speak of two things, of God as the King of all the earth and of the call to his people to worship him uninhibitedly. But this psalm has a different twist as well. Halfway through, the mood changes in the middle of what we might call verse 7, from the call to worship to a rather severe warning. So sharp indeed is this warning that some modern liturgies break off at that point, preferring to keep the encouraging first half and quietly ignore the bracing second half. Ever since I first met that trick many years ago, I felt it was a bit of a cheat. The text is the text, and throughout scripture and in real Christian life, worship and trusting obedience go hand in hand. If God really is the great king, as we declare in the first half of the psalm, <clears throat> it can hardly be thought odd if his subjects are reminded to take him seriously in trust and obedience. Not much point saying he's the great king and then ignoring him. And indeed, when we look to the New Testament, it's the second half of the psalm which is expounded in detail, specifically in the third chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. I'll come back to that. Everything rests, of course, on the call to worship in the first six and a half verses, because worship remains the very heart of the human vocation, and particularly the vocation of Israel and the church. No doubt this psalm was used again and again in the temple in Jerusalem, particularly in processions when pilgrims were arriving at the outer court and were celebrating their chance to go on in to the place where heaven and earth met, the place where the one true God had promised to put his name. 
Now, there have been many ways in which Christians have retrieved that theme in the Psalms, the most obvious being that the role of the temple is taken now by Jesus himself and by the Holy Spirit dwelling in us so that we, Paul says, are temples of the living God. So when we invoke the presence and power of Jesus and when we tune in to the Spirit's life within us, we are responding to this psalm in the way appropriate within the new covenant. More specifically, as we read the psalm through, the call to worship has two movements, first in verses 1 to 5 and then in verses 6 and 7. Some people divide them up a bit more, but I think that's about right. And then there is the sudden change of mood and tone. The first two verses are simply the congregation encouraging one another to celebrate with loud, unrestrained praise. When verse 1 and then verse 2 say, make a joyful noise, it clearly doesn't simply mean make a pleasant, quiet murmur, which is how, of course, some people still take it. The repetition, though, rubs the point in. There is something about strong, clear, loud music and singing, which not only expresses what one ought to feel as you come into God's presence, but which, because of the strange way we humans are made, it actually prepares us and shapes us for that entry. There is something about singing, as Jews and Christians have always known, which actually forms the person and forms and reforms the person in fresh ways. Verse 1 already states the reason for this in the character of God himself, which is then explained further in verses 3, 4 and 5. He is Yahweh, Israel's God. He is the rock of our salvation. God as rock is a frequent theme in the Psalms and elsewhere. The metaphor obviously evokes the sense of absolute solidity and reliability, being able to stand secure on a great rock in the desert rather than the shifting sands, or indeed to build your house or even the house of the Lord upon a rock rather than upon marsh or sand. And this is then expanded in verse 3. Yahweh is a great king above all gods. In the ancient Near East, the Israelites knew that there were many gods and lords, just as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, there are many gods and lords out there, but there is one God and one Lord for us. But these local objects of worship that the Israelites were to remind themselves are a sham. They're not the real thing. The extraordinary claim of Israel and then of Jesus and his followers to this day is that the God we see revealed in the story of Israel and then supremely in Jesus himself is the only being worthy of the word God. Just as around Israel, local citizens might uh, be the leading people in their respective villages, but everyone knew that the true king was to be found in Jerusalem, so there might be local cults and idols in the nations round about, but the Israelites knew that there was one God and that they had privileged access to his very presence. That point is rubbed in by verses 4 and 5, which stress that Yahweh is the creator and ruler of the whole world. This is the very opposite of those philosophies that see the present material world, the space-time universe, as a shabby second-best sort of place from which we might hope to escape into a world of pure spirit, whatever that might be. No, the psalm speaks of God's hands holding and shaping all things like a potter cradling his special creation. God's hands come in at the start of verse 4 and at the end of verse 5 so that the way the poetry of those verses works symbolises the point that's being made. He's got the whole world in his hands. However deep you go into the earth, says the psalmist, however high you climb up the mountains, God is there, verse 4, holding everything together. And then verse 5, whether you take ship across the sea, whether you go further and further inland, well, God made it all and holds it all in being. There is no sense here, which you do find in some Jewish texts, that the sea is to be seen as a dark, dangerous, anti-God force. No, here this is robust. He made it all, 
and he looks after it. It belongs to him. This robust creational monotheism stands at the heart of the call to worship. People often comment that the fashionable religious attitude of the modern Western world is some form of Gnosticism, where people sit loose to the material world, all their material bodies, and look for a new hidden knowledge, gnosis, which will show them who they really are, often very different from the way they and the world really are in fact, in the space-time and matter sense. That kind of super-spirituality, which became quite popular towards the end of the 2nd century AD and has come back in waves ever since. And it's a super-spirituality, or indeed we might call it a pseudo-spirituality, but it is here firmly ruled out. The call to worship is the call to worship the God who made the world, who sustains the world, who loves the world, and as we know from the New Testament, is in the business not of throwing it away or abandoning it, but of remaking it, launching that project with the resurrection of Jesus. New creation, then, is the affirmation, the reaffirmation through healing and transformation of the original creation, not doing away with it and starting something different. The call to worship is then repeated in verses 6 and 7, and this time the focus shifts from the loud and cheerful song of praise to the physical prostration, bowing down and kneeling. Some of us love to kneel, but these days some of us find that our knees let us down. I remember an old clergyman saying to me that he found himself as a high church spirituality in a low church body. In other words, he wanted to kneel, but he found it actually difficult. But the things we do with our body can teach the rest of our whole self what's actually supposed to be going on. Of course, physical positions and gestures can become empty rituals, but our bodies, which themselves are part of God's good creation, like the sea and the mountains, they are designed both to express the attitude of our hearts and to remind our hearts what attitude they ought to be having. And this time, the reason which is given corresponding to the idea of God as king, is that the king is the shepherd. We often find that, of course, in the Psalms, famously in 23, but in many others as well. He is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Last night, Maggie and I watched a TV programme about sheep farming in Scotland, and it was wonderful to see the care and attention lavished on individual sheep whether shearing and grooming, or checking the feet, or making sure the eyes and ears were all right. We are the sheep of God's hand. He takes us in hand, just as he has the whole world in his hands. There is then every reason for the glad, uninhibited worship of verses 1 and 2, and the glad, humble prostration of verse 6. Then comes the transition. It's one thing to sing, it's one thing to bow down in worship, it's quite another thing to listen for God's voice when he's telling you something you didn't actually want to hear. Notice how at this point in the psalm the person speaking changes. Up till this point it's been leaders of worship encouraging the congregation, now it is God himself who speaks. And the song now takes us back to the time of Israel's wilderness wanderings, which in the New Testament is referred to a few times as a model of where we find ourselves now as Christians. Because like the children of Israel coming through the Red Sea and then heading home to the Promised Land, we have come through the waters of baptism and we are heading for God's ultimate new creation, the new heavens and new earth, for which the original Promised Land was a long-range signpost. But Like the children of Israel, God wants the people to arrive in their inheritance as people who have been formed and shaped to be his people indeed, to be people who can worship him with genuine loud songs that come from the heart and with genuine bowings and prostrations which express what they most deeply believe and feel. God wants his people 
to be the sort of people through whom he can then reveal his love and glory to the world. So it's vital to heed the warnings about what can go badly wrong in this phase of the story. Verses 8 and 9 look back particularly to Exodus chapter 17 and to Numbers chapter 14. The first was when the people challenged God, despite having seen all that he'd done already, to prove that he really was in their midst by providing them with water to drink in the desert. Well, you may say they did need something to drink. Well, yes, but they expressed this not with trusting faith, but with a cynical challenge. Is God really with us? How quickly they had forgotten all that he'd done and the pillar of cloud by day and of fire by night. Likewise, in Numbers 14, 10 of the 12 spies said there was no way that they could successfully invade the promised land. They'd better go back to Egypt. Verses 10 and 11, God's analysis of this was severe but clearly accurate. In their hearts, the people simply hadn't understood who God was. They hadn't grasped what he was doing and what he was still going to do. That's why that generation had to wander for 40 years before in the end it was only Joshua and Caleb, the two spies who had believed God's promise, who led the new generation into the land. The letter to the Hebrews quotes this passage as a challenge above all to faith, not to a blind obedience, but to a belief in who God is, the God of verses 1 to 6 indeed. Do we, who have seen and known all that God has done in Jesus, do we trust that the God who raised Jesus from the dead is able to do all that he's promised? This challenge, of course, comes to us globally at a time of wars and rumours of wars, a time of climate anxiety, of crises of mass migrations, never mind all the personal challenges that we face individually. It comes to us in our churches, not least those of us with long histories and traditions. Are we ready for the new challenge today? That word today, if you hear his voice, rings like a great bell. It's not enough to put it off till tomorrow. It's not enough to say, oh, one day I'll get my act together on this one. No, today is the time that matters. The psalm encourages us to believe that God has indeed prepared the ultimate new creation, the rest which corresponds to the rest at the close of the original creation. We are creational monotheists, worshipping the one God of creation, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, worshipping with gl him with glad songs and shouts and with humble prostration. Let us also be creational monotheists in our heart of hearts, trusting that the God who is the rock, the king, the shepherd, who holds the world and us his sheep close in his hands, that this God is going before us into the new creation where we will praise him and live in his presence forever. Therefore, today, when you hear his voice, you know what to do. I really believe that the Lord was impressing on my heart to get to know his word in a greater way. I've always had mountain moving faith. I've always just, I've always just believed God and trusted God. But uh, I think one of the things that the Lord was pointing out that my biblical literacy was not where he would like for it to be. And so, so I began to uh, pray like, Lord, I want to know your word in a greater measure. I want to know your word in its intention. I was getting tired of the traditions. I was getting tired of the different expressions that almost were divorced from what the author's intention. I became very unsatisfied with some of the answers that I would have with either church leaders or pastors and just the way that I was taught. And so I, I prayed one day. I said, uh, you know, just in the time of prayer, like, Lord, I want to know your word in a greater way and in a greater uh, measure. Well, my occupation is I'm a video editor and videographer. Um, but for the past year, my desire and passion for biblical studies has just increased and the Holy Spirit pointing at him has caused me just to just pursue that fully. I'm enrolled in school now. Uh, one of the things that has really stood out to me with uh, N.T. Wright is the idea he first introduced me to is um, that the Bible was not written to us, but it was written for us. And also, um, even that was like, okay, what? Like that didn't mesh well. And then. And also, when you read the Old Testament, have the ancient Israelite in your head. When you read 
the New Testament, have the first century Jew in your head. There you get the context. There you get the, you know, the biblical author's intention. And so I didn't realize how uh, centric and almost from a self perspective, it was like, oh, the Bible is about me. You know, there's an egocentric, I, you insert yourself into the biblical stories. And it's like, well, the author's not really writing to you necessarily, but nonetheless, it is for us. There's takeaways and principles. And I think it's important because one of the things that N.T. Wright that I appreciate so much is that he's just trying to get everybody back to the scripture. It's like, okay, you know, all of these other things are great, they're helpful, but let's just get back to the text. To just going through the book of Acts and in this intensive has just been so incredible, not just getting into the scriptures itself, but N.T. Wright has a beautiful way of bringing that world and that mindset to us so we can be able to understand that world. I was telling some friends here, I was like, I've never saw Michael Jordan play, but uh, this is my Michael Jordan moment. <laughs> so very grateful for you, sir. One of the things that a ministry like this requires, and it's no surprise to you, we require funds to keep this going, and we need help because the tuition that we charge for our online courses covers only one-third the cost of operating this ministry. This year, as everybody knows, has been a hard year for everybody financially, and it's true for every nonprofit president or CEO that I've talked to. It's a tough environment for nonprofit organizations, just like it is for regular people. But we're asking for people to donate to our ministry at admirato.org. And we're asking that you might respond by clicking on the, the link that is at the bottom of your screen that is, actually it says this, it's uh, admirato.org slash pages slash donate. And we hope that you would donate through that platform. And we have great news for you. We have a matching grant of $20,000 to help you along so that up to $20,000, your gift is matched. We want to thank every single one of you that have tuned in online and those people who are here present that have been part of this to understand how important it is for us to be not only positioned well, have a presence with people, and that they would that people would understand that our posture is, is one with open hands saying, God, do what you're going to do, so that the possibilities that we can achieve are amazing and perhaps world-changing because we're in the right place at the right time with the right material and with wonderful men and women who are bringing God's word to God's people. And that's my request for our online audience is that they would be able to donate knowing that their donations would be matched up to $20,000. And we're thankful for them to be a part of this time and listening to this presentation. 10 years ago this month, I was faced with a decision. I was faced with a decision about what to do with the next stage of my life. I consulted with Stuart Briscoe, bless him, a wise friend, my first senior pastor, a colleague, a mentor, an encourager. I told him that the only idea that came to my mind during my time of unemployment was that we should make high quality biblical education available to as many people as possible. And he told me this. He said, you're faced with two realities. Number one, there is a huge need throughout the world for high quality biblical and theological materials. And I nodded. And then he said this, number two, there is almost no appetite for such high quality resources in the Western world, in the Western church. Huge need, lack of desire. 
So we launched the Wisconsin Center for Christian Studies. And with that, I'm going to briefly turn to Isaiah chapter 55, where through Isaiah the prophet, God says, As the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the pur purpose for which I sent it. If you think of the basketball as biblical and theological resources, and you think of the world as that goal, not 18 inches, but over 4 billion people that we need to reach. And what we have at the Wisconsin Center for Christian Studies is world-class biblical and theological resources. Our goal is to spread that out to the worldwide audience. We're uniquely positioned to do that. And thanks to you, we have opportunity to make that happen. The question is, how do we get what we have to those who need and want it? When we started, I, uh, I went to the president of a major foundation with the idea of online courses. This is back in 2014, and uh, this is just after massive open online courses began, as Jennifer mentioned. And I went and I said, here's my idea. Professor N.T. Wright, world-renowned New Testament scholar, is available to us, and we'd like to make him available to the world through online courses. And the response by this particular president of a foundation said, you're too small, you can't do it, it's not going to happen. As Jennifer reported, we have over 123,000 students representing 195 countries. I did not count how many courses we've launched, but it's somewhere around 42 or 43 courses featuring Professor N.T. Wright. We have world-class resources. We have world-class content, not only from Professor N.T. Wright, but from others, including Professor Esau McCauley and other people that we have consulted and are actually on our platform. The question is, how do we position ourselves to get out there into the broader world? The real, other reality that we have, and my mentors, many of them, said this. You are the Wisconsin Center for Christian Studies. Nobody around the world actually cares where Wisconsin is. <laughs> now, we who actually know and live in Wisconsin may say, we know where Wisconsin is. We have many Green Bay Packer fans who know where Wisconsin is. But outside of that, if you're living in Rwanda, South Africa, Australia, China, you really don't know where Wisconsin is. And so people said, you really should think about changing your name, position yourself a little better. Because frankly, Wisconsin doesn't resonate. My apologies to Wisconsin residents. So we needed to do a name change. Painful after 10 years of saying, but we are this. And people know us as this. But the experts were saying, if you're going to position yourself well, you've got to change. Face reality. The game has changed. Just like with Steph Curry and the three-point world, the game has changed. And let me mention a couple of these things. We've built Admirato as a learning platform to enhance our position, highlight our posture, increase our presence, to heighten the possibilities for the next decade. We want to represent the wonders of God through our teaching. Those surprising moments when the Spirit of God makes somebody's face light up with the wonder, like, I've never seen that before in Scripture. I've never understood that about God before. 
and everything then changes in that moment for that person. Why? Because they've encountered something that we've presented online now as admirato. Why admirato? Because what we're trying to do in our sub uh, our, 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 our tagline is engaging theology, which you've already heard about. Not only engaging theology because we're wanting it to be engaging theology, that is, you doing it, but you're also so encouraged by doing it that you're understanding that it's something that you study and that it's something that you do. You engage in it so that you're engaging while doing it. That's the part of engaging theology. Our position as Admirato, or Wisconsin Center for Christian Studies, is this. We have 10 years experience or more. I've been teaching online for nearly 20 years, but we have years of experience with learners both online and in person. In a post-pandemic world, let's face it, the online experience is not going away. In fact, people are relying more and more on that, and we must make sure that we're on the forefront of delivering high quality material. We also have the largest library of courses from Professor N.T. Wright, one of the leading New Testament theologians of our era. Our online footprint actually consists of about 700,000 people in all of the various avenues that we deliver content. It's exciting because we're positioned well to do what God has called us to do, to help people engage in God's word by his spirit to be renewed by him. That's what we're trying to do. And we're positioned well, and you can help us do that in your participation with what we're doing. All of our resources are going to reside on Admirato. Admirato.org is going to be the place where you find everything that we produce. That doesn't mean that you can't go to YouTube and find some of it or on version, but Admirato.org will be the place for all of it. We'll have free resources. We'll certainly have some of our courses that require some tuition, but we want to emphasize the impact that we can have online because we're there, we're positioned well. We've been doing this now for 10 years and people are wanting the material. Seminaries, you may know, are closing. Why? Because people cannot do residential training as easily as they could. Now, virtually everything is online. We're there too, but at a much lower cost. And most churches want to do training in-house, and we're there for them. That's our positioning. Uh, what is our posture in all of this? I hope if anything becomes clear to you, it's this, that we want to be a gracious space for people to learn, a place where they sense the humility that we are saying, we are offering this. We don't say that we have the absolute 100% sure word on a particular verse but we want to be engaging in dialogue with other people, with godly men and women through the work of the Holy Spirit to gain the wisdom of God. And we want to be inviting and at the same time provocative. I'm sorry to use that word, but it's really a good one because we all need an ice pick to attack the soul and loosen it up so that we can hear God again. We want that for our people, but we want it to be a loving environment, and we're so glad to be able to offer an environment where people can engage with one another in our communities in a way that's safe, and no one, by God's grace, and we will point it out if they do, if they start attacking, we will say, there's no room for attacking here. I'm sorry. That's not what we do. Our presence is so important. Your help has allowed us to hire people with wonderful abilities to do what I cannot do and to do it with expertise and excellence. 
Our staff is a highly qualified team with pastoral hearts. Our response rate to people when they call on us online, Jennifer talked about it, she gets back to them right away, even if they're saying, I don't know how to reset my password. And she helps, usually within 12 hours or sometimes even less. I had a phone call just two days ago from a woman who said, my church wants to study the N.T. Wright course on 15 essential texts. How do we do it? And I told her, I would love to tell you how, but I don't know, but Jennifer Lou knows. <laughs> In any case, my apologies to Jennifer because she gets a lot of this. Uh, at the same time, we have these communities that Charlene now is a part of our, she's a part of our team interacting with people. Our presence is there. It's a personal presence. Gracious, we hope. Humble, interactive, inviting. And then lastly, the possibilities are endless. Why? Because we know that the online world right now is nearly infinitely available to us as long as we act with not only humility and grace, but honesty, integrity, so that people will sense that we're not trying to pull anything over their eyes but we want them to engage in honest discourse under the guidance of the Holy Spirit so that they can be encouraged with the possibility that God may have something for them that they've never thought about, and they can be a part of it because they're part of this online world. Now, we still do in-person events, and we still love to teach personally in our local area or go somewhere like we've been in Houston, but we know that many, many people would be engaged with us in our online world. And I want to just pray and give thanks for you all. Thank you, Lord, for the people who are listening to this and watching this online, for the people here present, and for the way that you have positioned us by your grace to move on from Wisconsin Center for Christian Studies to admirato.org and for all the things that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for joining this live event called Building Together. We're so thankful that you've joined us. We know that there are many of you who have been supporting this ministry, Admirato, and we encourage that you continue to do so. And there may be others who wish to donate, and we ask that you would click on the link below. I'm going to turn this over to Professor Wright for a benediction, but I want to thank you again for joining us for this time together. Professor Wright? May Almighty God make you faithful to his calling, cheerful in his service, and fruitful for his kingdom. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and through you with those to whom he sends you, now and always. Amen.